Okay, thank you, David. Um, Today, we're really excited to welcome Jordan Harari from um, CRTKL. I hope I got all of those letters in. She is a thought and design leader in Zero Waste, uh, promoting uh, deconstruction and material reuse in commercial architecture. And this year, correct me if I'm wrong, you were nominated to the Design Future Council. Um, which is a huge honor. So we are very, very lucky to have you and look forward to hearing about all your work, Yarden. Thank Take it you. away. <laughs> Sounds good. So um, it's really great to meet you all and let's see, share my screen. Um, and it's fun to see how much the AI Philly Coat has really kind of taken the charge in just materials, deconstruction, reuse. Um, especially with Daphne spearheading kind of all these different speakers. Um, so glad to be here. And I think what's awesome about a coat is that obviously it's a lot of collaboration from different firms and across kind of the ecosystem of a city. So um, what I'll focus on today is just a couple of initiatives related to collaboration, especially um, there is one collab that we did within our firm, but a lot of it has been beyond CRTKL. So talk about the CoLab, um, all for reuse initiative, and then a collaborative mapping effort that I hope you'll contribute to. So just a little bit of context and where I was coming from into the kind of circular design and circular economy universe a little bit was that I was working on a lot of commercial interiors projects, especially retail. And they had a super, super short life cycle, um, and that in many ways is inherently wasteful, but creates an opportunity when we start to think about materials and opportunities for uh, better utilizing and saving our resources. So some of that is just because they are short and predictable leases, we can kind of plan ahead and kind of see things coming down the pipeline. A lot of commercial projects utilize premium and durable products and standardized assemblies. So we know what's inside them, generally what they're made of and fit outs are, small but many, especially when it comes to kind of a fleet of stores. Once you solve a challenge in one place, you might be able to apply some of those lessons learned. And then the same goes for having long-term relationships with our clients and our vendors and all the different kind of people that go into a project and can look at the issue in sort of a portfolio scale and kind of iterate over time together. So probably don't need to go too deep into just the fact that this is a major issue across the industry and the world. Um, with every process, there are obviously carbon emissions and alongside that waste created. And just the idea that there's people along the way either impacted by the way we do things today, but we also, being in the built environment, have the power to change some of those processes and decisions. And so if we're really thinking about working what we, with what we have and kind of thinking about what if landfill didn't exist, um, we have to start introducing deconstruction, design for disassembly, but also sourcing reuse. And um, kind of most simply, that is just creating the supply, the demand, and just enabling the cycle through our work. But it will probably not be so simple and we'll need a lot of different pathways to um, find materials, new homes. So the first kind of experiment that we did just to see if there was interest around this and kind of bring people together was a collab workshop last fall. And what we found is as architects, obviously, we tend to navigate between a lot of these different pressures and kind of get potentially pulled in different directions based on just meeting code, client requirements, construction needs. Um, but this was an opportunity to be conveners and kind of make worlds collide a little bit. So the objectives were really about gathering cross-discipline insights, sharing some success stories and challenges, um, trying to think about what some high potential products might be that we find in the environments that we're building in, thinking about some of the gaps and barriers in the market, and then really just start building those relationships to set up projects for success. Because it's really all about who you know, knowing who to reach out to, and then figuring out what questions to ask. So this is just a snapshot of the different groups that were represented in the collab. 
and really tried to get the whole ecosystem from kind of policymakers upstream and deconstruction specialists kind of able to show us what the future could look like, um, along with connectors and retail brands who were our clients and general contractors who can kind of speak to what's happening today. And so much of that is also just understanding that there are real people behind this work and putting faces to it. So quite a few opportunities for, for action. Um, and I'll just run through them quickly. But basically connecting people is unparalleled. Um, conversation is part of the work and allows us to tackle any of the kind of technical challenges if we know that we're all on the same team. And with that, we can start to create some partnerships, but also create some demand where if our client will tell us that they have a priority and make a demand for us to figure out details without using glue, we'll figure it out, right? So being able to have that give and take of both kind of putting some peer pressure on each other, but also being there to support each other and taking kind of baby steps into this, into this work. And a big piece of that is that whenever we set at the beginning of a project or at the beginning of a vendor agreement really sets the tone for what we prioritize downstream as the project goes on. And we can start to change that. And that's a blend at every scale, right? There's regional public policies that are starting to move towards addressing embodied carbon and zero waste. Um, but there's also kind of lease agreements and how a tenant is receiving a space versus what they have to leave behind at the end or how they have to um, kind of engage with the, the environment that they're coming into. Brand IP is an interesting one that um, is maybe especially poignant in retail, but I'm curious if that has come up of um, clients saying that this is my material and it can't show up anywhere else, but figuring out some of these workarounds and of course the project level specifications of how do we talk about reuse and how do we talk about deconstruction in the project level and kind of what's happening on site. We are obviously trying to recreate a supply chain. Um, so it's very complex, but with every gap, there's potentially a business opportunity and new partnerships to be had. And last but not least, obviously is planning for disassembly um, both in design, but also just in the process of the project. So asking questions of each other, where do things go? What happens to certain materials when they get broken down? And just being curious to start to understand more um, what's happening in the field to then be able to think about how could we do things a little bit differently. So the key takeaways from those discussions are really just that technology alone won't save us. We can't kind of recycle our way out of our waste issues in the built environment. And so we have to work together. Um, business opportunities seem to be what will really spark and drive success. Policy can guide, but not initiate. And then the groundwork is really people work um, to shift kind of mindsets and behaviors and that this is just as much a communication issue as it is a physical and technical one. And so I'll talk a little bit about the All for Reuse initiative, which you may have heard of. Um, it is trying to build the demand across the ecosystem and starting to figure out, you know, how do we how do we cultivate this material reuse ecosystem and send a signal to the marketplace of providers of materials that reused materials are actually a viable solution and something that the industry wants? And then encourage new enterprises to launch to basically support that vision. So as you can see, there's the full material, the full building life cycle, um, and within that just what's gonna to happen to the materials? Where do they come from? Where do they go? And having ways to share this information. So you can see a little bit about the goals where it's the obvious environmental impact of reducing carbon waste and the use of new resources. But it's also about bringing more people into the fold and creating more enterprises around circularity. So more jobs in deconstruction, 
in warehousing and remanufacturing and resale, basically every piece of the puzzle along the way. And then trying to find ways to make this be crowdsourced and collaborative so that it can scale up quickly. And the focus audience for kind of committing to, to buy reclaimed, and this is especially focusing on commercial materials just because the traction in the past has been mostly on residential. Um, so the commitment is looking at large portfolio holders of real estate, just because if we can address colleges and universities or large corporations or government agencies, they can be the catalyst to really change how we handle materials kind of as smaller projects, the smaller teams, just because they oversee so much physical, physical stuff. And the reason for that now is that there's a lack of market demand. Um, even if we were to deconstruct, there isn't, I guess, the incentive to deconstruct everything and create supply intact because there isn't obvious demand around reused resources. And part of that is because there isn't consistency in quality or quantity that's available that works with the way that we might work and specify materials. So it's a bit of that chicken and egg problem. Um, but the idea of all for reuse is that if there's demand, supply will come. And this is just a view of the organizing team. We are coming from different backgrounds. Um, obviously, I am coming from an architecture background, but we have um, some consultants and general contractors and also kind of representation from Madrone and Doors Unhinged are some of those enterprises that are kind of new business models around this work of um, deconstruction and salvage, which is Madrone, and kind of they do donation matching to local businesses, and Doors Unhinged, which focuses on commercial doors. So um, kind of closing the loop. And right now what it is really um, is just a network of practitioners and enthusiasts. It's a platform for sharing knowledge, and we have a website where just resources are are uploaded and are available. And it's a resource for getting other people started to just help kind of spark some of these local hubs. But it's not an organization yet. We're still, it's been a year. So just kind of a, a group of people trying to figure out um, what the best way to encourage each other is. Not a sales pitch or a guarantee um, or a free advice hotline. So still just trying to figure out what the best way is to just help other people take on this work. Um, and share what we know so far. And this is just an example of a resource that was created um, as part of a workshop series this past year. This one happened to be in the Bay Area, focused on the Bay Area, uh, but is available to all. And you can kind of download it from our website, but this one happened to be created by Arup and was sponsored by San Francisco Environment and Stop Waste for that, for the series. And so, if you guys are interested in Philadelphia, there's just the opportunity to basically be a hub and, and push this further. Um, there isn't any like dues or anything. It's really just being able to have a place to collaborate and put all these resources together into kind of one shared system scale. So if you're ready, um, feel free to email info at allforreuse.org or check out the website. But um, no pressure, just a way to all stay connected across geographies and cities. So the last thing I will kind of talk through and then hope to have some discussion is collaborative mapping effort that has been underway and hopefully will launch and be fully live in the next month or so. Um, and it was born out of the idea that, you know, so far a lot of reuse and deconstruction questions have been sort of one-off or haphazard and just trying to figure out one project at a time, you know, where can I donate different materials? What architects can help me learn how to source reused materials? And are there any contractors that do deconstruction specifically um, and will know how to take apart some of the spaces that we might be working in? And as we talked about a little bit earlier, um, 
there's going to be a lot of different ecosystem players. Some of us already exist and kind of work with each other, but quite a few might be new types of business models that don't exist today, or we'll need to come in to kind of fill in the gaps of just what we don't have um, when it's not coming from a new, a new source or straight from the manufacturer. So this was kind of the history of it is just, it was two parallel initiatives, um, both happening kind of around the same time and we found out about each other earlier this year um, and are now in the process of converging into kind of one, one source of truth, one resource that anyone can go to. Um, but as part of the Building Green Peer Networks, which I don't know if, if some of you might be part of already, um, after the summer summit last year, one of the kind of initiatives that we took away was the idea of, you know, material flows and who gets to be involved, what's the impact. And so kind of focusing on the people piece of circular economy and building product ecosystems at the same time, um, who I think you'll hear from Amanda Kaminsky, if you haven't already, um, was also working on a similar effort following some research that was sponsored by Google. And so Really, these both were looking at trying to develop a user-friendly shared resource and trying to build capacity and reduce the uplift for making material reuse, so an industry standard. So how do we make this easier and common um, and just the way we work? And because they were both map-based, you could start to see a local market's reuse maturity, kind of is there a policy, are there deconstruction contractors, are there you know, habitat restores or, or other reuse resellers so that we could see who's already out there doing the work and who could we start to reach out to if we're trying to do things a bit differently than just kind of demo and source new. So the goal was for us to also start, just be able to spark new conversations and start to also expand maybe what some of these businesses are doing if they're only in residential, how can they also start to look at commercial and how can they start to work in a way that also can support some of the projects that we might be working on. So it kind of has three parts. There's the map, which is the sort of first interface because this really is a geographically based thing and we're all uh, definitely appreciate the visuals of being able to kind of see the lay of the land quite literally when it comes to deconstruction and reuse the database that feeds all of that, and then just a fun gallery view that allows you to kind of look at the data differently depending on how you want to use it or what you're looking for. This is just a, a sneak peek behind the curtain um, of some of the information that we are gathering about different entities and kind of how we want to capture this in a way that is useful. And We've broken it down into sort of overarching ecosystem roles um, from the boots on the ground, kind of reuse resellers and deconstruction to the enabling infrastructure between kind of literally physical hauling or warehousing and some of the storage needs that will have to happen for materials up to kind of public policy and how that helps lay the groundwork. Um, network and resources and remanufacturing facilities or recycling, which actually is that much more effective when you do source separate and do deconstruct. So we know that that may not be the first choice, but is always going to be part of um, some of the medley of solutions that we have. And then training and education and consulting and research to really keep growing and adding more people and be able to expand this and keep evolving. And within that, um, we know that there's a lot more specific services that people might be looking for and that different organizations might provide. And so this is where there's tags that can be selected around all the different services and probably will want to add more over time, but it's starting to understand how do people use different terminology? Do some organizations in one region say, um, you know, think of themselves as full structure deconstruction versus calling it architectural salvage. And just this is where this resource can start to be a little bit more nimble and 
start to kind of mature as the industry matures too. So this map looks a little bit um, naked, <laughs> but it's just because we're in the process of um, shifting all of the data from kind of one map to another and bringing together all the resources. So they're just behind a gate. And over the next probably month, you'll start to see this get repopulated with all of the entries that we have so far in the actual database. Um, so just to see kind of like, this was an earlier version of the map where we were just testing the ability to very easily add um, and crowdsource via Google My Maps. And the idea of this is that this new resource will have the same ease of adding, but will not be as easy to accidentally mess up or delete, or <laughs> it will have a little bit more um, kind of rigor and, and just maintenance to keep it up to date than, than this first map. But this just shows you know, how it got populated very quickly um, because it was really about people adding um, whatever organizations they knew about that were local to them. And so that's what we want to be able to keep doing. It's not um, two or five people doing all this research. It's really about people adding from what they know. And the fun part is that you can see things in different ways. You can look at the data both as a grid, as kind of a spreadsheet view, and start to also see it in a gallery view where you have some images, some kind of high level information that you might want to see about the, the different entities and then click into them and learn more. And again, this is kind of just a starting to really tease out and understand more granularly who needs to be involved as we are trying to deconstruct, reuse, and really kind of enable that to be just the standard way of working. So a couple of ways to participate. Um, and I can share these or I can share them when it's like fully live, but the forums are at least ready to go. Um, if there are existing entries that need some more detail or need some revisions, we wanted to be able to have the option to engage with that first before you kind of go and feel the need to kind of add a new one to, to make it more correct, let's say. Um, but this is just a super simple form for identifying existing entries that might need some revisions. And then new entry forum is for um, anyone that might know about an organization that's in their area and you wanna just add one because you know about it and are excited to contribute. But if you want to add more than, I don't know, three or four, it might start to get uh, tedious to try to go through the form every single time. And so we're also creating a batch upload option where you can get basically the columns and all the data that we're looking for in spreadsheet form and then fill it out kind of at your own leisure. Um, if you wanna be kind of a local liaison because you know about a lot of different organizations, then this is one way to contribute that's a little bit hopefully more streamlined and then can share it back with us so we can just plug it right into the map. And just a brief overview of kind of what's next is the timeline was September or summer 2020. This is sort of started as a exploratory idea. And then this year in the summer, we really um, gained a lot of momentum with the push to merge the two maps and resources. And in the next month or two, the goal is really to go live and have that map that you saw that was really naked be populated with all the entries that we do already have they're just in the database kind of behind a gate because they don't have all of the information on them yet. And then in the spring, really being able to kind of share this much more broadly, um, get more people involved to add to it. And then knowing that there will probably be many lessons learned that we didn't think of as we went through it, just to have um, opportunities to support people as they're using it and make any kind of changes based on feedback. So it's been, um, a volunteer, kind of a shared collaborative volunteer effort so far, but um, we'll see. We'll see what it leads to next. And that that is it. So thank you. I kind of tried to breeze through, but I realized maybe I had more time than I thought.
Any questions? Thank you, Yarden. That was really awesome. You covered a lot of ground. <laughs> it was a whirlwind. <laughs> I know. As I was preparing it, I was like, mm, maybe I should slow this down. But I hope it wasn't too overwhelming. No, not at all. Um, I really appreciate seeing me personally, the whole overview, because here in Philadelphia, things are beginning to pick up even more with deconstruction. And um, we, there are several people on the call who are participating at different levels. The policy and advocacy group is very involved in helping to move things forward, but also the zero waste folks um, are certainly hoping to seize more on the material aspect. So um, I don't know if members from both committees would like to ask questions. Um, it's certainly your, your presentation couldn't come at a better time. Happy to share. I had a question. Um, I, I'm not on one of those committees, but um, I, I was hoping maybe you could kind of walk through an example um, and maybe I, I had an example in mind and maybe you could tell me, you know, how best to follow this framework or even, you know, the general steps in, in you know, engaging with a deconstruction consulting firm or if this is, you know, a, a team effort. My experience has been that it's, you know, it's something that might be specified by the architect, but generally implemented by the contractors. As an engineer myself, um, you know, there was a RFP out a few months ago down in Baltimore, and it was for a, uh, an old mall that was being replaced with mixed use, um, with the mixed use community. And in my head, I was thinking that they were reusing the structure, but that's, that wasn't the case at all. They were completely demoing it, which is just, as you can imagine, a ton of material. So how, how might I, um, could, could you suggest ways to prompt the owner to want to go down this path um, when it's not one of these, you know, leading edge um, thought leader type clients, um, when it's more of just a standard developer, and then how best to use these resources to, you know, have an effective reuse strategy? So... Those are great questions. And I think the, the collab was kind of born out of a similar idea where retail has historically been a laggard um, when it comes to kind of pushing the bounds of sustainability. Um, one of the strategies of doing it in kind of collab form and a little bit removed from the day-to-day -day pressures of projects was to be able to just open up that conversation a little bit more. Um, and have them be able to meet some of the deconstruction contractors that work in the area, just start to see the field. Um, that may not kind of win them over, but it, it sort of teases out maybe some of the interest in seeing that, I think leveraging the idea that no one on a, on a personal level wants to see materials go to waste. So just trying to like see how much you can tug on the heartstrings to, to make it um, be real, but then also pair it with the fact that figuring out who these people who are around to be able to do that work, which is hopefully where the resource can help, um, can maybe kind of help put it over the edge of actually being able to do it. I think the, the other side is um, we've seen clients kind of save or reuse resources as a, as a practical measure. Um, so a lot of it is also kind of storytelling of just showing why that is also beneficial for other reasons um, and kind of using these things that maybe they already do or already think about but are just being practical and not trying to do it to be cool to also be cool <laughs> and like have that competitive edge um, okay but I, I can take you through what it looks like to add a new entry I don't know if that's what you meant um, well I was kind of thinking you know it I absolutely agree with that one graphic that you said all the people that, you know, play a role in this, there's so many different people. Um, and I feel like in, in a developer's eyes, they might see that and just see dollar signs. So like, what would be kind of the streamlined pitch of, you know, um, this is, this is how we do it. And this is why, you know, you should, you should do it. Is there, you know, cause they're in it 
for the money. Um, most of the time, you know, it's not, I love working with the, you know, the LBC clients and people doing net zero everything, but, you know, developers are the ones that I feel like take up the most land and, and the headspace of uh, a lot of firms like ours. So I was just wondering, what's that like, um, the streamlined approach? So I think, and this is, the industry is probably not there yet, but the ideal is kind of, if you can exchange like demolition for deconstruction, some of it will add more time. And that is something we have to either figure out or just manage expectations around. Um, if we can start to source reused materials more consistently, then that I, might reduce the cost of materials. I think for now, because it's still just so new, um, it is going to cost more and it is going to take more time because we're figuring it out. So, womp womp. <laughs> but like, yeah, yeah. I think we'll, we'll, <laughs> no baby um, steps. Got to eat steps. the elephant one bite at a time. All right. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I, I love the work that you're doing. Thank you. We have, yeah, we have some projects maybe on the horizon where we can start to test that. So if, if I have lessons learned next year, <laughs> I will gladly share them. Hi, if um, nobody else has a, another question, I'll jump in here. Um, so hi, uh, great, great stuff you're doing. I mean, I will say that, um, you know, the map and the resource and the connections you're, you're trying to make are really great. Um, and I guess I'm wondering what, um, what types of scales are you thinking of, of populating this? I mean, I could see from a, a large building scale. So if I walk through a couple of really quick scenarios, you know, you have a large building that, you know, client might be demolishing and, you know, you, you know, there's either some large trees. We, you know, we, we did a project for Penn State and they actually process some trees, but they don't always have clients for their wood, but maybe there's more clients for that, for demolition materials for that large building down to a small building owner that just has, you know, some work that they may be either GCing themselves or they have a small GC. Um, so you have both the people that want to upload materials and what sort of, um, you know, providers could they go to or find on this map? And then on the flip side, you have people that want to be customers and want to reuse this materials. You know, I'm sure all of us, you know, at one point think like, oh, wouldn't it be great to use like, you know, some sort of reclaimed wood in the project somewhere or, or you know, brick or something somewhere. And, and, you know, again, from a large building scale down to a residential scale. So I guess I'm wondering how you're thinking about those different scales. For now, we're not being too discerning um, only because if we limited it to commercial and kind of the larger scale, there wouldn't be that many resources. Um, and so from the scale perspective, I think a lot of the businesses that are already out there serve more of that smaller scale. Um, but hopefully by putting them on the map and having a way for people in the commercial market to reach out to them can start to show like there is interest, there is demand. Maybe people would buy light fixtures or doors or something from them if they stock them because a big piece of that is you know they're not going to accept donations if they don't think that they're going to be able to resell them um but let me let me actually share my screen and i'll show you what the the form looks like to add new entries because that might also help show kind of there's um how we broke up the the categories um and this was roles. So reuse is kind of the, if you're looking to buy or looking to donate materials. Um, so this is kind of the idea of reuse resellers and, and sort of the, the types of players around that. Um, deconstruction is if you need someone to do the deconstruction or physically do the salvage. Um, hauling warehousing is something that feels like it's not quite specific to deconstruction reuse industry, but it might just be the players that we already, or our contractors might already work with, but starting to have them haul kind of materials, not just to the landfill, but to warehouse or to storage or to a reuse, especially in that larger scale, this is something that will probably be more, more critical. Um, government and public agencies, network resources database. So that might be a material marketplace. So if you're looking online to try to see what materials are around, this map and resource isn't going to help you, but we might be able to like a materials marketplace will be something that would be a node on the map. And then you can look at actual material supplies. 
um, remanufacturing. So that may be fabricators too, or people that do work on materials to get them back up to a um, specific kind of quality or spec. And then training and then consulting this category will still try to figure out exactly what it should be. Um, a lot of these organizations might do more than one thing. So we did give an option for kind of a secondary role and then being able to kind of click through all these different services that they might provide. Um, one thing that as this grows or as kind of this might speak to kind of the specificity that you might look for to start to address different scales, but also if you're looking for specific materials, you don't want to just start kind of having to call everyone. Um, if there are focus areas for these organizations, then these are listed generally along kind of CSI division. So you can start to kind of track that and, and list these. Um, addresses so we can map it. And then sorry. the other piece is also um, nonprofit, for profit, but a growing focus, I think, is. Um, business designations around increasing diversity in the industry. Um, and this kind of speaks a little bit maybe to Justin's question before. Uh, developers, I feel like, are getting some more pressure to show that they're engaging with diverse businesses in construction and developing. So starting to see um, a lot of these will be small businesses, but if we can encourage growth of also diverse ones, um, that will just be something that we want to keep at kind of the forefront as we start to kind of grow this sector almost of the industry that isn't isn't always isn't predefined yet. And then if you're adding it, um, this is just for us to be able to contact if we have any questions. But just wanted to kind of show that. Um, I just, if I I'd just like to jump in and comment that, um, you know, we're asking you all these questions, but really this is an extraordinary <laughs> work that you've done. It's volunteer. It's like addressing like the mega, you know, national global issue. And we certainly can support you in terms of, you know, inputting um, the resources that we have in Philadelphia. I just want to say that this is like the most elegant, um, sort of presentation I've seen on this issue. And this is really gonna be sell well to architects and designers. I mean, just when you mentioned this issue of glue and how, you know, you can design out the glue, like we have to do that. And most of the waste is so filled with carcinogens that, you know, this is a beginning point for us to begin to address how we design products, right? So. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I had uh, uh, just a, a thought, or not to continue to, along too long, but uh, one of the things that we do when we do our drawings and specs is then we issue them to plan houses, which is really a source for contractors, demolition contractors, re, re, uh, rebuilding contractors would go to to find out projects. So would there be a place that we could post projects to attract deconstructors uh, so they have a source. And it would uh, potentially, uh, these plan houses are subscription typically. Um, contractors subscribe to these plan houses in order for leads, project leads, that it might be a revenue source for you in the future for selling subscriptions. And it would attract those deconstruction and demolition contractors that are attracted and know how to, to do this work because it would provide them with a source of opportunity uh, project leads. That's a great idea. Um, and it might be something for build reuse is um, they're like a national nonprofit focused on reuse and have member organizations that are kind of these deconstruction contractors, some of the reuse retailers. So I'm gonna pitch that to them. <laughs> I mean, I think that that's a great idea. And that's, I would say in the future, <laughs> probably relevant, but I, I do think builder use might be the best host for that. I think this map will also be embedded in a couple of different places so that it can be reached from different places, but also it becomes kind of, it's not a map that is being kind of hogged and can only show up on one site. So um, hopefully that can help increase the visibility 
of Build Reuse, which is the entity that has historically kind of supported a lot of those deconstruction contractors, um, more from the training side. But I do, I do really appreciate that idea of kind of the, the business opportunity side for them of kind of how to get ahead and cut down some of the time too that I think it might take to find them if they can find you if you're uploading these projects. So thanks. That's a great idea. I'm gonna take that note. I, I would say that you know the one aspect that I, I didn't mention when I was asking about the map too is I mean I, I think what you're doing is is fantastic about creating one potentially one central place. It's sort of like uh, you know, forgive the analogy, the Google for material reuse. So you're not having to go to different resources or maps. It's sort of like it comes up first on searches and you know <laughs> that everybody is inputting that. So if I'm in an area, it's not just going to give me Pennsylvania or the Philadelphia region. You know, I can go to New Jersey or any and if I'm in New Jersey, it's looking up to New York. So it's it's the map. So that that's like one thought that you know I'm I'm sure you're you're striving for. You know, it's it's sort of like the big goal, right? The big kahuna to be the resource. Um, so the other thought too, when you were going through the form too, I, I had a question about how um, owners might manage if their materials are contaminated. If they're, and I know it's something that you know nobody likes to think about from a liability standpoint. But if there are resources, I know there's EPA when you know dealing with lead and, and asbestos, and there's certain protocols. But you know maybe just having those resources available so people can say, well, I, I don't know if it's contaminated. Can you help me, or can somebody mm -hmm. help me? And what is the what are the the people or groups that could help them with that? That's a great idea. Yeah, we have. It's like you know, posting the policies if they have deconstruction policies. Um, and so just as easily, I think that's what's fun about this is that it is very nimble. So just as easily we could, you know, if you have ideas on resources that help building owners understand kind of what's toxic, what's not, which will also probably locate, be location-based, um, that is definitely something that could be added just as, just another entry, which is, is the fun part. And I think um, I do have to say that the sustainable design leaders is what allowed this to be kind of like, we want to be able to zoom in and out because we're all coming from different places. We all will be looking at different places on the map or our projects are in different locations. So um, I may not always want to look at either only Seattle or only New York or only kind of where I'm working just because in the commercial world, we do kind of look at, we do often have projects that are not just where we are. Um, so I appreciate that, but I, also, I just wanted to share that credit with with all of that peer network because it was it was definitely a group a group initiative. I hate um, to cut this conversation short, Yarden. Thank you so much for your presentation um, and for all the work you're doing. I share the sentiments of everyone, um, and I know there are a few more questions in the chat too. Is there a way for people to reach you um, to continue the the conversation? I will drop my email in the chat. Um, so feel free. And if you want a link to this form, I can share it now or I can share it kind of next month when we're fully live. I don't know. No, that would be great. And we have a newsletter too. We'd love to share oh, any awesome. resources uh, that way. Um,